very uh, positively. The enthusiasm is very great, but we need to consolidate that across the country and make sure that our message sits very well with the, the voter so that we will, be, uh, uh, get, we will be able to get their votes and form the next government in January 2025. Honorable, thank you very much. That's the uh, Minority Chief Whip, the Honorable Gavin Squami Agboja, uh, speaking there. If you come to the University of Education, Winneba, where the NDC, any moment from now, is expected to launch its manifesto, this auditorium is getting readied, and you can see a host of members of parliament, leadership of the NDC, for all walks of life, really, are uh, coming through. You see... Um, uh, Dr. Dufour, who uh, was uh, a presidential hopeful on the ticket of the NDC, you see former minority leader as well, Haruna Idris, when a host of others uh, here already and waiting in the next, what, two hours plus, a little under two hours, we should see the commencement of this particular event and what the NDC says is its big plan, grand plan for the Ghanaian people to rescue the nation and to reset the country. This is your election command center. The pipeline company has issued a threat to cut or shut down the pipeline. Crude oil production has reduced by 30%. The energy sector debt keeps ballooning. In fact, 2022 alone, ECG made a loss of about 12 billion. That's a huge amount. And so this manifesto seeks to rescue the energy sector, to turn it around. As we go through, particularly the energy transition, as we go through the energy transition, it means that we need to reposition Ghana so that we are not left behind. And so clearly, renewable energy forms a major part of the manifesto. Um, access to electricity forms a major part. And then more importantly, we want to ramp up production of crude oil as well as process our own crude here in Ghana. On, on oil production and the likes, we've seen, uh, we've seen a decline of some sort. Uh, over the course of the last eight years, you've sat behind as an opposition, watched the space. Have you been able to detect what it is that has contributed to the continuous decline? In fact, Piak in its, uh, one of his latest reports actually raises that as a concern and asks that something be done in that regard to ensure that uh, production is boosted because uh, otherwise then revenue from that side as well uh, could, could dwindle further. It is because of the underhand dealings in the sector. There's a loss of confidence. There's political interference. Some few people have hijacked the oil sector. And so the big players do not want to engage Ghana any longer. Oil production has declined significantly by 30%. That is huge, given the circumstances that we find ourselves. And so we want to bring back the lost confidence. We want to bring back transparency, accountability, and increase oil production. Our target is to do 400,000 barrels a day in the long run and we are confident that we will increase oil production as well as increase gas production for power and also for the fertilizer and petrochemical industry. You mentioned um, WAPCO issuing some threats. I want to return to that. What, what's the situation in that regard? We know that we owe them some amount of money. How real is this threat that you speak about? It's real because the last time they threatened, they shut down the pipeline. We are talking of just $12 million. Government is unable to pay that money. That tells you the state of the energy sector. It tells you that the sector is crumbling, the sector is collapsing, the sector is on the verge of collapse. Something must be done. And the only way we can do that is to change this government. But when you talk to investors, their general feeling is that they need a change of government so that confidence will be restored. Thank you very much. Uh, Honorable, just lastly on, 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 the, on the judgment debt situation with regards GCPC, you've, you've spoken... Uh, made certain comments to come back that you know which has resulted in this huge over 100 million dollars debts which government is being forced to fork out to GPGC. Yeah, because government shouldn't have cancelled that contract in the first instance. The Tenga committee advised government not to do that. But I can tell you there was a family feud between some members of the president's family. And so they decided that they would punish one another. And then through their own personal feud, they extended it, which has affected the states in a very negative light. The unfortunate thing is that of the 134 million, the next NDC administration would have to pay that money. This is a huge amount of money that could have been used to buy even a power plant, to build schools, to build hospitals. We would investigate that matter. And where we find criminal negligence, the next NDC administration would hold those people 
criminally responsible and prosecute them. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's the Honorable John Jinapo. Um, uh, also here, uh, see a number of the legislators of the NDC. Let's try and pick the thoughts of Osman Bukhari as well. Uh, he is with the National uh, Youth Wing of, of the NDC. And we will pick thoughts briefly as well from Mr. Bukhari. Mr. Bukhari, we saw earlier in the week, the launch, or two weeks ago rather, the launch of the uh, youth manifesto of the NDC. Today the full document is, is coming out. What should young people expect outside of what we heard uh, two weeks ago? Yes, the launch of the NDC's manifesto was just a microcosm of the main microcosm. So what you should expect is something bigger, what you expect is something larger, what you expect today is something deeper. So what you're going to look at now is the various sectors of the economy. When you take health, when you take education, when you take transport, when you take fisheries, when you take agriculture, the number of jobs that will be created for young people. So today young people should expect something bigger than what actually happened at the UPSA auditorium on the 12th of August. That we can assure you. There's been talk about feasibility of some of the, of the plans uh, in terms of whether or not young people should be able to trust the NDC to deliver on, on these promises. What can you say to that? The NDC has done it before and will do it again. With the issues of jobs, we have delivered on the issues of jobs. Because during the NDC's tenure, we didn't have 1.9 million unemployed youth. And the NDC, when it comes to the creation or the construction of uh, developmental infrastructure, we have done it. When it comes to the agriculture sector, we have done it. When it comes to stabilizing the economy, we have done it. So between the NDC and the MPP, young people are more tilted in believing the NDC than believing the MPP. Because we have done it before, we are going to do it. And today, we are giving you realistic promises, achievable policies, and policies that we can equally and actually do within a short possible time. So young people out there, get ready to hear or to see how we are going to turn this country around. And to the young people out there, most especially the game changer, the 24-hour economy, it is going to happen, it will happen, and it will be here to stay. Thank you very much. Right, thank you very much, uh, Osman Bukhari as well. As with Osman Ayarega, sorry. Uh, uh, Osman Ayarega also with the NDC uh, Youth Wing providing a bit more details for us in relation to uh, what it is to expect. A lot more uh, individuals as well continue to throng uh, the auditorium here where uh, the expectation is that in a couple of hours uh, we should kickstart this particular uh, event. Uh, let's speak to the South Dai MP Roxy Nelson uh, Dafiamepo uh, as well. Pick his thoughts in relation to uh, what to expect a lot later today. Honorable, uh, many thanks. You're live on your election command center, TV3 and 3FM. Um, talk to us as a, as a legislator. How is your constituency looking for the NDC? Thank you very much. Uh, let me use the opportunity to say good morning to my constituents. I'm here with my sister Angela Lote from Afajato South. We are the Professor Jufu Sanamua Mensa Auditorium, University of Education, Winneba. Uh, you, you can see that the, the ground is swelling to launch the manifesto in a couple of hours' time. Indeed, we want to increase our percentage. It is percent this year now generally speaking the expectation of the people for this launch should, should be that one uh, that level 100 students who enter the university and who for one reason or the other are not able to enter because on because of pecuniary reasons because of their state of impecuniousness that is inability to pay school fees they will hear good news today his Excellency is saying that starting from the academic, that is 2023-2024 academic year, level 100 students entering all public tertiary institutions in this country wouldn't have to pay those atrocious fees, which often serve as a bar to denying them admission to tertiary institution. The argument is that how are we able to fund that? And I'm saying even if you reduce the ministerial portfolios from about 125 to 60, the expense that we we'll save will be sufficient enough to manage this, this, this policy. Two, 
I expect people to hear from His Excellency John Dramani Mahama that at least some monies will be made available to give capital to women in this country to serve as a capital for, for those who owe, who have tabletop businesses, corner shops, and other businesses in the country, and market women to be able to make uh, livelihoods uh, potential for them in this country. Three, we expect the people to hear from us today that a special bank will be set up for women so that women who want to entrepreneurship and business can have an institution designed and reserved for them to seek funding. They wouldn't have to compete with other men. Remind you, we have just passed the affirmative action. So as part of the implementation of the Affirmative Action, action Act, the NDC is postulating that they will set up a special women banking to serve the peculiar needs of women in this country. Again, I expect our people in the rural areas, especially my young people, my Okada boys in South Dai, to hear today that we shall, we shall commercialize and legalize Okada such that the policeman in the corner at the Sikuma will no longer arrest my Okada boys because they don't have a license. Or even if they do have a license, the Okada business ought not to be commercialized. So that those young people who, for the sake of Okada, no longer engage in petty thieving, no longer breaks down people's doors, no longer jump windows or jump over walls to go and steal, who, and are able to engage in commercial activities for which they are able to marry, they are able to build, they are able to engage in other social and commercial activities, they will be able to do so comfortably in a regime to be introduced by Excellency George Damani Mahamam. But above all, but above all, we want Ghanaians to hear from us today that there will be a new regime for accountability on the part of public officials, not merely politicians, but also public servants who, under the cloak of public servants, steal from the public purse. There will be a new regime for accountability. There's, 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 a, there's a concern that that will be a bit difficult. Your question, let me conclude that even the judiciary will have a new regime in, in hearing cases, that the courts will no longer sit from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. and go to sleep. There will be a new court system that will sit from about 3 p.m. to about 10 p.m. in the evening. So that cases that are adjourned for one month, two years, one month, or two months, and three months, where, 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 where petitioners, where plaintiffs, where defendants, where respondents, where people, litigants who, who, who pay a lot of money to assess our justice delivery system, come back with pain and a lot of uncomfortable stories about judicial uh, justice delivery system who now go home smiling that their cases that they brought to court have been expeditiously heard and justice have been meted. Honorable, on the, on the case in point of holding uh, persons in this government accountable, there's a school of thought that it will not be easy as you make it seem and that you're riding on that particular cocktail or coach to to swindle Ghanaians that when you come you jail appointees under the Ekufuado government. It's, the argument is that it will not be as easy as you make it seem. That cannot be because we, we hold the standard the standard in measuring that promise. Indeed, it is only the NDC that is able to hold its own to account or hold the feet of its own appointees to the fire. You, you know the story of those who engage in, in SADA, you know the stories of those who engage in other 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 crimes that offended the the that crimes that were established to have occasion under the regime of his excellency he didn't mean words he didn't shy away from prosecuting them indeed his excellency prosecuted his own indeed his excellency even upon smelling smelling an illicit intent of amassing wealth his excellency sacked people from his government so we are saying that if anybody thinks that it is not it is not doable. We have the track record to establish that it is doable. And indeed, don't let the question be made that we are only going to go after the, the, the persons who have who have corrupted themselves or their office under this regime. Any public servant, any government appointee, be it and Kufuado or His Excellency John Dramani Mahama, if you misconduct yourself on grounds of corruption or corruption related matters you will not have it easy under his excellency John Dramani. He will deal with you in accordance with the law. So please be assured that there's a new regime coming. 
a new regime of accountability, a new regime where in excess of one million dollars will not be found under your bed and then you'll be asked to go home and nothing happens. There will be consequences for illicit actions in public office in, the, in this government. So I thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Asura. Honorable Roxanne. Um, thank honor you, regime where journalists will feel safe. And that's, 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 that's what you're promising, a new regime where journalists feel safe. We feel very, very safe. You can speak your mind, say whatever you want, but with some level of dignity. And so we believe that John Mahama is winning. He has won the election. We are working very hard. The women in my constituency are eagerly waiting for the establishment of the Women Bank where they can get their loans from and pay back in, 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 um, in installments. And so we are, we, we are ready. We are ready for power. On the, on the affirmative action that's been passed, uh, what do you look forward to under, under John Mahama with that law now passed? Knowing very well in this country that a lot of laws we make are sitting without being uh, implemented, we want to assure you that in this particular case, John Dramani Mahama will make sure that, that the affirmative action bill, everything about women there, will be worked on and implemented to come to its fruition. All right then, honourable. Thank you, thank and you. we look forward. We look forward to to you as well. And so we continue to sample thoughts briefly, uh, briefly in relation to what it is to expect, and we can speak as well to an individual of uh, of particular interest. Um, perhaps I'll just pick, uh, pick the thoughts of Adam Agbana, K2 North Parliamentary candidates just briefly as well uh, as to what he makes of today and the significance particularly for young people. You're a young person yourself uh, getting the opportunity to represent the NDC uh, on the ticket of uh, on the ticket of the NDC in K2 North. Talk to us about expectations ahead of today particularly for young people. We've had a lot of things. Job continue to be uh, perhaps the biggest uh, ticket item for many young people. Uh, talk to us about what to expect today. Well, I, I think that I have had a privilege of sitting in some of the subcommittee meetings to discuss uh, some of the policies for the young people of this country. And I am excited, I'm very confident that this manifesto is just what the young people of Ghana needs. We talk about jobs. Unemployment is the biggest concern for many, many young people. In this manifesto today, you will see some clarity in how government intends to provide jobs. Very detailed research has gone into finding the solutions to the issues of unemployment in this country. And I am confident that this manifesto is the right answer to the questions that the young people have been asking. If you ask me, majority or most of the policies in the manifesto are pro-youth policies. And that is why President Mahama had said on countless occasions that his coming as president from January 7, 2025 is to provide opportunities and jobs for young people. And so in the manifesto, I can assure you that young people would find many policies that would define their prospects and their future. We can go into some of them. The 24-hour economy. In the heart of the 24-hour economy, is job creation and productivity. It's been, it's been described as a policy you cannot explain uh, and that if you say 24-hour economy, what really is it? It's more like just a big thematic subject which it's not clearly defined. You will not be able to find the tangibles that will create the jobs for, for the young people. It is very difficult to wake up somebody who is pretending to be asleep. Our friends in the NPP are pretending not to understand this policy. But, I mean, that is, is, is fair for them too. But we have explained, and President Mahama and all our communicators, we have explained, what is 24-hour economy? We're only saying that government is deliberately embarking on an agenda to ensure that companies are activated to work within 24 hours. So one person or one, one job, three people, three different shifts. And it's as simple as that. And that is what President Mahama describes as the one three three formula one job three people three different shifts and simply that now what it means is that the probability of increasing uh, employment opportunities is very high because if you're running a shift system it means that you obviously have to employ more people to 
work and, and, and to work and feel within the shift system. And so the policy is well explained, well defined, and we have explained several times. The NPP can pretend not to understand the policy, but it's not for them. And I can tell you, for those of us on the ground, as a parliamentary candidate, anytime I engage young people, I have a clear understanding that young people of this country understand the policy. They have accepted the policy and they are going to vote for the 24-hour economy come December 7, 2024. Adam, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that's Adam Agbana. He is the K2 North parliamentary candidate of the NDC. We'll take you back into the studio, but the conversations are not going to stop here at the Alfonso's uh, Auditorium here at the University of Education. Whenever where more and more people continue to come in in their numbers in anticipation of the launch of the NDC's manifesto. This is your election command center. 